Yeah, I mean, I first started doing rental real estate like, oh boy, like 2006 is when I first started doing that. Then I got my butt kicked in the last recession, went from millionaire to upside down millionaire during that time. So I was over a million dollars in debt by the time I came out of that, that re last recession. Um, but I battled my way back out and was able to rebuild it and regain it again. But uh, yeah, I mean, now when I started doing real estate again, it was right around 2015, 2016. I started getting back into it and, and uh, had the courage to, to finally get back in the real estate game. Welcome millionaires and future millionaires. You're listening to the Millionaires Unveiled podcast, the show where you'll hear the stories and interviews of everyday millionaires. We'll unveil their decisions, their strategies, and their portfolio allocation. Now to your host, Jace Mattinson. Welcome back to another episode of the Millionaires Unveiled podcast. This is episode number 365. Jace, you just celebrated the 4th of July. How was yours? You know, funny enough, it was the same as yours. It was a great patriotic celebration, that's for sure. Man, it is uh, definitely getting warm, and uh, I'm loving my my summer so far. Hope everybody out there is as well. We've got a lot of things in the global economy, I feel like, heating up in general, and as well as our national economy that will uh, see what happens. Should be an interesting uh, rest of the summer and, and into the fall. If you'd like to be on the show, Send us an email, millionairesunveiled at gmail.com. We got some more uh, openings in the fall months and a couple late here in this summer as well. Always looking for new great guests. If you haven't heard your story, shoot us an email. We'd love to feature you. And there's several professions out there too that we're still uh, knocking on the door to, to feature as well. So today's episode, we have Chris. He's a net worth of $3.3 million. He's got a quite a remarkable story. He grew up in a trailer park. He and his wife now has eight kids. And uh, yeah, he was nearly bankrupt, went through kind of 08 and uh, almost nearly lost everything and has built everything back up and uh, primarily focused in real estate now. But uh, yeah, this could be a great episode with him. He also has a, his own small business that he runs as well. And we get into kind of the makeup of that and evaluation and whatnot. Uh, yeah, without any further delay, let's get in right into the interview with Chris. Chris, do you want to just give us a lot of your background and what you're up to now? Yeah, right now, I mean, I'm basically work optional. You know, I'm kind of like semi-retired, although I can never fully retire because that sucks. But, you know, having, you know, having eight kids between my wife and I and trying to raise and get them all out of the house empty nested, you know, and everything, you know, it's a, it's a busy life. But I've got a company called Money Ripples where we teach people how to become work optional, how to work because they want to, not because they have to. I even have our Money Ripples podcast and we even do things with like infinite banking strategies to kind of teach people how to get their money to pay them twice. I mean, we do all kinds of fun stuff, but, but definitely we're against the grain. You know, we're not like the typical person that says, hey, why don't you save your money in that 401k for 5 billion years and then someday you might have something. That's not our thing. Like we're all about teaching people to get away from that stuff that really has been proven not to work. Awesome. And we're going to get into all the details of your story and the eight kids. That's pretty crazy. That is, I think, Trump's the most on the podcast so far. So congrats <laughs> on that. If you want to say I don't know if I should be proud of that or if it's like <laughs> just shows the ins level of insanity that I have, right? <laughs> well, we're, we're in the, the five, our, five boat ourselves. But uh, before we get into all that and the fun stuff, what's your net worth today? Net worth today is about $3.3 Awesome. And how is that broken up? Oh my goodness. I should have memorized all this because I know I sent it to you pre prior to this. Uh, about a million in the business. Um, there's about a million and a half or, or so in real estate. And then there's even some personal residence as well. And there's probably about uh, another uh, about 800,000 in cash or, or equivalents to that. Nice. And the money that you have in real estate, is that commercial or single family rentals? I've got a little bit commercial, but more in the syndicated realm, so more of a shared ownership. Uh, most of it, though, is either single-family rentals, got a lot of raw land that we've now like gone and sold to other people, so they're paying us like we're the bank. They're paying us the mortgage payments, so we do a lot of seller financing with that, have some debt funds, even some oil and gas stuff where it's the land, but we actually get paid royalties on that land, too. So a lot of, a lot of variety there. Interesting. And how long have you been essentially investing in commercial land uh, you know, syndications, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, I first started doing rental real estate, like, oh boy, like 2006 is when I first started doing that. Then I got my butt kicked in the last recession, went from millionaire to upside down millionaire during that time. So 
So I was over a million dollars in debt by the time I came out of that, that re last recession. Um, but I battled my way back out and was able to rebuild it and regain it again. But uh, yeah, I mean, now when I started doing real estate again, it was right around 2015, 2016, I started getting back into it and, and uh, had the courage to, to finally get back in the real estate game. Interesting. So let's rewind a little bit because you bring up the, the recession and losing and getting yourself into a seven figure hole. Did you have to declare bankruptcy during that time? I should have. It would have been a lot easier, <laughs> um, but uh, I'm too dang stubborn. And so I didn't actually do it. Um, although it would have been much easier. Like, like I tell people, like, uh, it's funny because I talked to a guy who actually was homeless uh, during that time. He was an Uber driver taking me to the airport the other day. He's like, yeah, I was actually homeless in 2015, 2016. I was like, I was in a place where I was a million dollars more broke than you were, you know, <laughs> because I had all this debt to pay back, but I had no money, no credit, nothing at that point. Wow. And was that all on real estate? Uh, no. Um, I mean, it, it started because of real estate a little bit, but it also, I launched a business in 2007 with some partners and that started going south because we were focusing towards real estate investors, specifically flippers who were getting hosed, you know, in 2007 and then going into 2008. So, um, between all the expenses I started accruing, I started like just living on credit cards for a little while. Um, and then the next thing I know, I mean, like the values of my real estate tanked. So then I'm upside down on my real estate, end up foreclosing on my dream home that I had purchased in 2006, foreclosed on it in 2009 and, uh, lost, I had to go back to renting again, which was ironic. Cause once I went back to paring down to almost nothing, that's when all of a sudden everything came back again. The money started coming back in. It was almost, I was, it was almost like I had to lose everything to get everything back, if that makes sense. So walk us through just the psychology of that a little bit of going from millionaire to not millionaire to clawing your way back and feeling like, hey, I can actually make it through all this. I mean, it seems like that was about a five to seven year period of your life. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, it's, I would say that whole period was about a decade. Yeah. It was about a full 10 years. Uh, so let me, let me give you a little bit of backstory here. Cause I mean, I wasn't starting out as a guy that was like a financial genius. Um, and I proved that in the last recession, obviously, but, um, I, I went to college and, but I realized that going to college, I was going to be stuck kind of doing the nine to five thing, or maybe nine to nine, you know, depending on how your job works out. So I ended up realizing in college, I should probably be a business owner of some sorts. And so I, I looked for something. And finally, the first thing that landed that seemed interesting was being a financial advisor not realizing they take anybody off the street as long as you could pass a test and not be a criminal, right? Not have a criminal record. So I started doing that and actually enjoyed doing it in the sense that I, I was learning about money and stuff, you know, differently, mostly about mutual funds, you know, those kind of things. And, uh, and I did that for four years, but I'll tell you the interesting thing was that, you know, when I was raised, when it came to money, my dad was very much like the cheap, you know, like really cheap. I mean, like this is the kind of guy that if he gets bad service at a restaurant, he doesn't just not tip. He goes and steals the salt and pepper shakers just to prove a point. That's the kind of guy my dad is, right? So he's the kind of guy that he would never say he's cheap. He'd say he's frugal, but we all know we would all call him like, just cheap, you know? So, uh, you know, I was raised by that. All he taught me to do was just save your money. And so that fit really well with the narrative of financial advisors because they tell you to pay off all your debt save everything you can, right? It's almost like the Dave Ramsey broke mentality, right? Just save everything, squirrel it away, and you should have enough someday to finally be free when you're like 65, 70 years old. Well, I go and sit down with my dad who had been doing that for years because he asked me, he says, Chris, why don't you become my financial advisor? I'm 61, I wanna retire now, I'm tired. He's like, literally, I'm dying working this job. I've already had strokes, I've had heart attacks, I'm ready to get out. So I sat down with him and for the first time in my life, he actually showed me his numbers because he was so guarded about his money. And I looked at his numbers. I said, dad, good job. You paid off your house. You're, you're completely debt free. You've been stuffing your 401k for decades. However, if you want to retire today, you better hope you die in five years because that's when you're going to run out of money. Okay, Chris, that's not what I wanted to hear. Can you give me something else? I said, I don't know. You did everything right. You know, I don't know what else to tell you. And that bugged me a lot. And it didn't help that I went to call a friend of mine who I trained to be a financial advisor, then left to go do real estate investing. And he's telling me how amazing his life is and how him and his dad are making just hand over fist. His dad was a professor at BYU. And he's like, yeah, like we've doubled his income as a professor in the last four months. I'm like, come on, that's, that's too good to be true. There's no way that people can make money that fast, especially with real estate, because that, you know, stock market's better. And he finally stopped me. He said, Chris, 
how many of your clients are truly financially free where they don't worry about money? I said, well, they all worry about money. Okay, Chris, well, good job. Way to help nobody. How about this? He's like, how many of you guys as financial advisors are financially free, not off the commissions you're earning, but actually doing these investments that you're recommending? And as I really thought about it honestly, I said, well, I guess none, because there's guys who've been working here since the late 1970s, and they still can't retire. There's your problem. And so that kind of got me down a different path, realizing it's not about accumulating all this money to become, because you can become a millionaire, you can become a net worth millionaire, but I'll tell you, the people that are like the Dave Ramsey fans, the people that go to try to save their way to wealth, you know, by paying off their debt and saving up and accumulating enough in their mutual funds and retirement accounts will come to me later saying, Chris, yes, we are technically millionaires, even multimillionaires, but we're broke. We're asset rich, but cash flow poor. We don't have income coming in from this money. Because even if you do the traditional retirement plan, if you happen to have a million bucks, you're only supposed to pull off 3% a year in retirement, not four. That's an old number that was disproven a long time ago, but people still teach it, but 3%. So that means if you have a million bucks, which most people don't even have in their retirement accounts, that's one and a half percent of people actually have that much in their retirement accounts. You live on 30,000 a year. That's, that's retiring below the poverty line as a millionaire. You're a broke millionaire. And so when I realized that that wasn't working, but I could still take, say that same million dollars. And this is actually a true story with one of our clients. Um, he took that million bucks and he you know, bought a few rentals like duplexes that are being managed by somebody else. He got into some apartment ownership that again, he man somebody else manages it. He doesn't do it. He did some things with like oil and gas like I've done. And he's done all these different things where he makes 100 to 130,000 a year with that same money. And I realized that was the secret. It wasn't about trying to accumulate a lot of money like you're trying to squirrel it away for someday, but it's actually getting it to generate real income, steady, predictable income. And that's what I started to do in 2006. I started to shift that, that mindset away from accumulation and instead to acceleration. And as I started to take that money and started to try to create more passive income, the next thing I know, later that year when I was 28, almost 29 years old, I was able to retire myself. And so I was kind of this work optional point where I'm like, what do I do with my time? Because all my friends are 28, can't do anything. So what do I do? And so I kind of kept, kept, you know, I kept doing some things part time, but I was really just kind of finding, trying to find purpose. And, and naturally when you do that kind of thing, people want to know how you did it. Right. Because I, I never advertised anything. It was just like friends and family were like, wait a minute, how, how did your life change so drastically? And so, uh, that's why in 2007, I came out of retirement to teach people how to essentially get out of the rat race, do like Robert Kiyosaki talks about in rich dad, poor dad, but actually do it instead of just being a nice airy fairy crap. And, uh, and so we started doing that, but of course that's when the recession hit, right? And we were focused all on these people that really couldn't pay us anymore. So our business that had just started to launch now was getting hosed. We're getting hammered. We're like negative cash flow. We're losing. We don't have any profits in the business. We're at a loss each year. Plus, I cut off my income streams because that's what my other partner said to do. He said, listen, if you're going to do this full time with us and we're going to be on this mission to save people, cut off all these other passive income streams, which is stupid since isn't that what we're teaching? We're supposed to be teaching them have passive income. And he told me to stop it. Like I wasn't thinking, right? I was just bought into the vision and the mission, right? So I made a lot of mistakes and I also made the mistake of stuffing all my cash into my property, into this new McMansion that I bought because I thought, hey, if I ever need the money back out, you just do a cash out refinance because in 2006, all you had to do is have a heartbeat and you could get a mortgage, right? You could, you could literally lie about your income and still get a mortgage as long as you had a decent enough credit score. So I thought it would be no problem. Well, when I needed the money in like mid-2007, I tried to get the money out because I was a business owner that said, sorry, we don't do that anymore. We won't let business owners have money out of, out of their houses. And so I watched helplessly as the, even though I had all this equity in my home, it slowly over the next year or so into 2008, it started to erode away at that cash and to where it was upside down. Now I was in the hole with my mortgage and my mortgage was owned by Lehman Brothers. And uh, you know, remember them, right? So um, I ended up getting a $300 suit settlement, you know, for, uh, for mortgage fraud from their, their end. But, uh, Eventually, I lost that house. 2009, I remember uh, just a week after our, before our first ch fourth child was born, um, a knock came at my door. The guy said, I just bought your house at the courthouse just down in Provo, Utah here um, just half hour ago. When can you get out? And I said, hey, can we have a baby first? You know, we're literally going to have a baby any day. And so, uh, so I actually paid him 2000 bucks just to let us stay in for two more weeks, had the baby the next week. And literally the next week after that, my wife has postpartum and we're moving out while we're bawling our heads off, you know, and 
moving into a new place, you know, and trying to shrink everything to bare minimum expenses. All the meanwhile, of course, I feel like a fraud because remember, I was the guy supposed to be teaching people how to get out of the rat race. I can't be teaching that anymore and be, you know, in integrity. So, uh, so even in my business, it was suffering more because I stopped teaching people how to get out of the rat race. I started teaching them how to get resourceful, how to find money. And my business actually shifted to that instead, which was interesting because it was perfect because in the recession, that was the number one complaint. People were like, I just don't have the money. I was like, I bet you I could find it. And so that's how our, my business started to really take off. Um, we actually pulled ourselves out of bankruptcy in, in, at the end of 2009, or almost bankruptcy. It was really close. And uh, we were able to rescue that business where we went from almost bankrupt in 2009 to making over $5 million the next year in 2010. So things started to turn around at that point. Um, of course, the funny thing is 2012, I, I ended up uh, breaking ties with that company, launching a brand new company, which is Money Ripples that I have now, and I had to start over again. But even despite that, and going through a divorce in 2015, still was able to uh, rebuild and bounce back and got to the point where at the end of 2016, December of 2016, I had enough money coming in that I didn't have to keep working anymore. Wow, what a journey. So when do you think you became a, me- a, a millionaire, I guess, the second time around? Was that in 16? You know, actually, I still wasn't a millionaire by then. Um, I had wow. enough income coming in, but I still was more like a net worth 100,000 air, right? so to speak. Um, but, uh, the millionaire actually happened, I believe it was 2000. It's funny because I kind of lost track. I didn't care. (laughs) I didn't give a crap because I was making enough money, but I think it was 2019. I think it was 2019 or 20 when finally I, I broke past that millionaire status. You should know what that is. That's the best kind of notification. That's the sound of another sale on Shopify. And the moment another business dream reality comes true. Shopify is the e-commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. In fact, I use it for several businesses that I have and my wife has. We love Shopify. Shopify simplifies selling online anything. And you can focus successfully growing your business. Shopify covers every sales channel from in-person POS system to all-in-one e-commerce. And it even lets you sell across social media marketplaces like TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. Hacked with industry-leading tools ready to ignite your growth, Shopify gives you the comfort of your business and your brand without having to learn new skills or design new code. And thanks to 24-7 help and an extensive business course library, Shopify is is there to help you have success every step of the way. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash unveiled, lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash unveiled to take your business to the next level. Once again, that's shopify.com slash unveil. And thanks again to Shopify for sponsoring today's episode. So prior to actually becoming a millionaire though, in your mind, you were financially free because you had enough income coming in, passive income, yeah. so to speak. That's exactly it. So walk us through, I guess, this, this mindset shift. You had this conversation with your friend mm-hmm. and he was making this money with his dad as a professor. Was that the key turning point that flipped all this on the head? Or did you go through a series of books and more education? Or did you just trust this gentleman that much that you're like, hey, this is this is the route I'm taking. I'm going all in now. Well, yeah, it's it's funny because early in that that conversation, it was really a debate because I was telling him that stocks were better than real estate. But uh, but then he asked me those two key questions that got me to to shift. Right. Um, So I said, all right, I'm open. Give me something here. And he actually didn't believe that was open. He's like come on, you just got done arguing with me, Chris. There's no way that you're going to listen to me. I was like, listen, it's almost like the perfect reverse psychology he used on me because I was like wanting it more. He's like, no, tell me. So he finally says, all right, if you're really serious, and I don't think you are, Chris, if you're really serious, go do two things. One, get this book that's lesser known by, by Robert Kiyosaki called Who Took My Money, which if I were to sum up the three-hour audio book for you, it means that mutual funds suck, <laughs> okay? Um, so that's pretty much the whole point of that book. And then the second thing he did is he said, listen to this radio show, AM Talk Radio, with these two real estate investors that were local. Uh, neither of them are, are doing it anymore. One actually passed away later that next year. Um, and then the other one, uh, he's, he's no longer in that business. But, um, but these two guys were on the radio talking about not even a lot about the strategies. They were talking more about the mindset, right? They were talking about this abundance mindset and you know, and even how the founding fathers, and this is what made the country of America prosper. You know, they're t- doing like a whole history lesson. And so I'm listening to this radio show every morning. It was like a two hour radio show each, each weekday. I'm listening to it. Um, I read that book, but then I was like, I need more, right? Like this not, they're not giving me enough. And so my friends started to talk about 
some of the real estate strategies and really about that, that income, right? Like for example, if you have a hundred thousand dollars, you know, like I said, if you are in the traditional retirement philosophy that financial advisors teach, you're told to pull off 3%. So that means for a hundred thousand dollars, you're only supposed to pull off 3000 a year so that you don't run out of money too soon. Well, if all of a sudden I have a hundred thousand dollars, but instead of gambling in the market, what if I got a contract agreement with an investor, like a real estate investor, where I said, listen, I will lend you this hundred thousand dollars to you, but you need to pay me 1% a month. And then after so many years, you need to pay me back my hundred thousand, you know, and maybe I'll invest it again. Maybe I won't. Well, that 1% a month then kicks off a thousand dollars a month, but I still have my hundred thousand that's protected, right? Well, that's basically the thing that, that shocked me because I was so much in that accumulation mindset to all of a sudden realize, wait a minute, what if I did make 1% a month on a hundred thousand? A thousand dollars a month is a lot better than 250 bucks a month, right? And then I pay a bunch of taxes on it. This is better. Like it's just, it, all of a sudden there was, there was hope again. So really for a couple months, I was kind of in this, I was kind of living on hopium a little bit, right? I was, I was on these fumes of like just, you know, ecstasy in a sense, because, you know, all of a sudden I had this hope and I was learning these things, but I had no clue really how to do it yet. I, I just knew it theoretically. I hadn't quite practiced it. And I remember I went out to, to lunch with two of my friends and these were friends that had done better financially than I had. And this is a, and so this is a few months later, I go out to, to lunch with them. And one of the guys just being a jerk, he just says, he asked me, he's like, so Chris, you got that Mercedes yet? Ha ha ha. You know, that's, that's how I imagine he laughed. I'm sure he didn't sound like that, but, um, but he's like, he got that Mercedes yet. And I said, did I tell you that? That's so weird. Like I'm actually, yeah. I mean, a couple months when my, uh, my license, my registration is coming up for renewal in July, I'm planning to buy that Mercedes. So yeah. And the, sm the, the smug look on his face sank. And all of a sudden he went from just being kind of a arrogant jerk to all of a sudden now, like, what are you doing? What's happening right now? Right. He got intrigued, even though I had, even though he asked me like, well, how much more money are you making? Nothing right now. I'm making nothing more, but what I'm learning is pretty incredible. And it wasn't really until about April, May. So that next month or two, I started to see that month, that monthly income start to trickle in a little bit more as I started to apply this stuff. Um, and then actually in May I bought the Mercedes. So I actually bought it two months earlier, uh, found a creative way to be able to do it faster. And so I ended up getting that Mercedes. Uh, and so it was kind of an interesting time because I, again, like I know that many people like this, like you're maybe you're not at the millionaire status yet, but you feel like you know how to get there. Or maybe it's just, it requires more time, but you got the naysayers in your life telling you, oh yeah, whatever, keep dreaming. You know, don't, don't you dare dream bigger than me because that sucks, right? But in truth, it's like, you know, like when you get to the point of, it's not just a possibility, it becomes a improbability, right? Like it's like, it's now like not even improv, not even a probability. It becomes like inevitable and more of inevitability is the right word, right? It's inevitable. Like it's just got to happen. And when you get to that point of not of like this firm faith, nothing can stop you from achieving it. So interesting. It seems like, uh, you had some fuel to the fire with, the <laughs> with the naysayers. So how long after you were introduced to this different concept, did you leave behind the mutual funds, actually pull your money out? You know, when did you uh, say, you know what, I'm going to take your word for it and, and get rid of all the traditional methods of, of building wealth? Yeah. So that conversation that my friend and I had was between Christmas and New Year's. And then I started listening to that radio show after New Year's when they came back on the air again. Um, I quit as a financial advisor in, I think it was mid to late March of that same year. So I try to make the two worlds work. I stopped going to the trainings that the financial advisors gave me because I was like, no, I don't want to, I don't want to teach what you're teaching. I want to know what they're doing. And so I was trying to make the worlds work. But when I got to the point, I went to one of their seminars and I got to the point where they're just, they're just hammering on financial advisors. I mean, bad. I mean, it was, and they even like, even after they started hammering on financial advisors, they even asked, are there any financial advisors in the room? You know, raise your hand. And, and I was like, there is no way I'm raising my hand right now. And my friend was right there at the table. I was like, dude, raise your hand. I'm like, no, I'm the only one in this room of hundred people that probably is a financial advisor. So I just sat quiet. And, and, and after the end of that, that seminar, I said, you know what? I, I'm done. And so I turned in my resignation that next Monday morning and I said, I'm out. And even though I was at the height of my practice, I was like, I, I'm done. See you guys later. And, uh, and that's when I started to really become a more, more diligent student at that point. So what was your first move? 
when you left your financial advising full time? And, you know, how did you start spending your days then? Yeah, first move was, what do I do with my time? I was still a, a stock coach for another company. So I was doing some education on the side. Um, I, I stayed on as a mortgage broker. So I, I did that because I figured I could stay away from mutual funds and stocks because I could see that that wasn't the way. So I stayed on as a mortgage broker that time. Um, and a few, about a few months in, I started learning like, I, I learned a strategy called like, you know, infinite banking where you can use like life insurance policies as like a tax-free supercharged savings account and use that to invest. I started learning about that. That was the first strategy I started to implement along with turning my home into a rental. So I ended up like selling my home to an investor, turn around and, and leased it back from that investor and then sublet it out to a, a tenant. So I basically sold my property, rented it back again, and then rented it to a tenant, you know, sub rented it, so to speak. So that was my first strategy, my first investment I started doing. And I uh, had that cash and I can start using that cash to invest, like, you know, let people borrow and pay me interest off of it and things like that. Um, but uh, at the same time, here's what th one thing that helps speed up the process, too, is I remember one of my friends that was kind of mentoring me. He was he was a millionaire himself. And he asked me, he says, Chris, if money were no issue, what would you spend your time doing? And I thought about it. I said, well, I'd probably travel more. And, and just so you know, whenever people answer that question, usually the first knee jerk reaction is whatever you're not doing. That's the thing that you'll say as the answer, right? I said, well, maybe I'll travel more. He said, okay, Chris, let's be serious. Are you really going to travel 52 weeks out of the year? Well, no, that sounds tiring. Okay, what would you spend the other 45 weeks of the year doing? And he's like, well, what about this mortgage business? You're doing mortgages. Would you do that? I said, nah, I, I don't know. Like, I love teaching about it, but I hate doing the paperwork. I said, I might do ballroom dancing, you know, like keep, you know, instructing that. I was teaching that at the local university and I'm kind of under the table a little bit. So, cause I didn't have a bachelor's cause I dropped out right before I got my bachelor's. So they wouldn't let me teach at the university, but I basically was, um, more like a sub teacher. So I was like, I probably would do more instructing at ballroom instructing. He's like, okay, so you do that, but you wouldn't keep doing the mortgages. Well, not doing the paperwork cause I hate paperwork. Well, Chris, why don't you find somebody to do the paperwork for you? Do people like doing paperwork? I said, Chris, there are plenty of nerds out there in the world that like doing paperwork. And so, it, so I went to that broker, the mortgage broker, and I said, listen, there's, is there somebody that fits this description that would like just take my, my people and just do paperwork? He said, yeah, go talk to Clark. Because if you have the name Clark, you're going to be a nerd that likes paperwork. So, uh, so that's exactly what I did. I went to Clark. I said, Clark, listen, if I basically spoon feed you clients that they already want to do, like they were learning like cash out money from their mortgage to use that to invest, to pay off their mortgage, right? Those kind of things. I was like, if I teach people how to do that and they want to do a mortgage, Will you do the mortgage for that for me? Yeah, of course. Great. Will you split me 50%? Yeah, of course I will. Because we had a license. I could do that legally. And so I started getting paid like a thousand or two thousand bucks every so often. These checks come in the mail from people that I'd spend maybe half hour or so with teaching them about how to get their mortgage to pay them. Right. And then turn around and they go and get that mortgage and voila, I'm getting paid um, really way less work than I was doing before. I was getting paid the same amount of, of money almost doing the same thing, but doing it all myself. So I was all of a sudden now working maybe like three, four hours a week at most. I was literally doing the four hour work week before Tim Ferriss wrote the four hour work week, you know? And, uh, and that's what I was doing. Like I was just very casual. I wasn't advertising or anything. It was just friends and family sending me people. And I'd say, great, you get this concept? Yeah, talk to Clark. And I didn't just stop there. I even went to like a wholesale jeweler in Salt Lake City because people at that time, I'm in my 20s, people are getting married a lot, right? Well, I remember there's a place I went to buy my engagement ring that was like a third of the cost of most jewelers. And I found out, guess what? They have a referral program. So I started referring to that jeweler. They pay me a 5% kickback. I'd get checks in the mail from that. So on top of getting all this real estate income, I was getting this unexpected income from just being a connector, right? And, and some people call that affiliate marketing today, but really I was just connecting people, hooking them up with solving the problems for them. Because if it wasn't me, somebody else could help do it. And, uh, and so that's what really started to skyrocket my income, uh, really without having to work a lot. So interesting. Um, I, I am curious how you balance um, this, you know, work optional with, with building net worth for the long run, because you said, you mentioned earlier, you really weren't tracking it for quite some time. And you're like, oh, I guess looking back, you know, this is when I hit millionaire status. So how do you balance? Well, I've, I'm making tons of money so I can live, live my lifestyle however I'd like versus 
well, I also still need to stow something away at some point, or do you just assume, hey, if I keep doing what I'm doing, the money's just never going to stop, so I don't really need to worry about the future? Yeah, it's it's probably a little of both. Um, here, here's what I realized, trying to retire twice, right? Because like I said, I did in 2006, but even then, like I was getting really, you know, while I was starting to have this money coming in, I was getting really antsy because I didn't have purpose, you know, and, and for me, I have to have purpose to, you know, something that's bigger than just me. And so I was really just kind of like, okay, I was kind of teaching people stuff just casually, but I wasn't like, it wasn't like a coach or anything like that. I was just mentoring people, but if they didn't pay me, they usually didn't do squat with it. So I just wasted my breath. So I kind of wasn't doing anything with that for a while. 2016, after I, after the end of that, I end up spending like a couple months in California. We're snowbirding because we hate, you know, cold weather. We actually snowboarded Austin the next year after that too. Just so you know, spent uh, like a couple months there in Lakeway, Texas. But uh, we would just do that every winter, you know. And and I remember just feeling like there wasn't that purpose, that drive. And and if I'm not doing something that feels like it's it's making a difference in people's lives, I really that's why the company's called Money Ripples. It's because as you're blessed financially, you have a greater capacity to bless the lives of those around you. And I thought, well, I can just be living with my family, quiet and happy, doing my thing, have enough income coming in. It's just fine. Uh, and I was still doing my podcast. Like I was still doing that. And so I was even get paid from sponsors to keep the podcast going. And I, I just had natural business stuff coming through. I really was like gravy, extra money was coming in from the business money ripples that I didn't really need, but it was great. You know, I, I didn't turn it away either, but, uh, but still I had to have some kind of purpose. And so that's where I've learned. I can't just work like five hours a week. Because I get depressed. So for me, my ma- my little magic, I guess you could say like magic week is like, I'm usually working between 10 and 20 hours a week, something like that. Like I'm still engaged. I'm still in a creative mindset, but I'm not like overwhelmed either. And so I find that right balance. So for me, that's what I kept doing. And so I think for most people, like even if you can get yourself out of the, the rat race, so to speak, right? You have enough income coming in to pay your basic bills. I think it's still a good idea to keep going. You know, keep growing your money, do something, something that gives you purpose, uh, you know, cause some kind of, it could be a passion project. It could be something that keeps you going and keeps you fired up for life because I don't, I really don't believe that people should just retire and die, you know, because there's a reason why people sometimes retire and die because they lose that purpose. You've got to have something bigger than just going to try to make money. And, but unfortunately that's how most people live. They live for survival to make that money, to finally get to the place where they don't have to work anymore. And then they get to that place and then they feel really directionless. They feel like they have no vision of their own life anymore, no purpose. So that's the key thing is that do whatever, you know, gives you, fills you with purpose, whatever keeps the passion going that makes you want to live life. And, and of course, I, I believe that you have a responsibility to keep blessing people's lives, even if you are work optional. So as you're directing people to kind of take control of their lives, it, it sounds like there's not necessarily one path to wealth that you're Mm -hmm. suggesting for these people, but more of like a mindset shift and a, uh, a call to do what they feel maybe called to do and pouring themselves into that? Or, or how would you, how would you summarize your philosophy on, on helping other people, you know, leave the rat race and, and build wealth? Yeah, I'll say this, that I, again, I believe passion and purpose is, is key. A lot of people will say, do what you love and the money will follow. Uh, I think that's kind of crap sometimes. Like it, it can be true. It's do what you love that others love you doing, then the money can follow. Because the truth is that dollars follow value, right? The more value you create for people in their life, the more that money can be asked for exchange. And so that was the thing that shifted for me in 2006 as well. When I realized it wasn't about getting lucky, getting on a ground floor of an opportunity, right? Or or trying to weasel money away from people, right? Or somehow be a liar or a deceiver or something like that to somehow trick people out of money. When I realized that the real key to wealth is actually figuring out how do I create more value for more people? How do I serve people? How do I solve problems for them? Where money is just the natural byproduct, the exchange to be able to have that in their life because they feel like they're better in their life to have you in it than, than not at all. That's the real key. That's the economic engine to get you to millionaire status faster. Now. That's think of that as the economic engine. That could be your job. That could be a business. It could be whatever you want it to be, right? That's that's what starts it. That's what fuels it. But from there, this kind of goes into like, have you ever heard of uh, Profit First by Mike Michalowicz? You know, it's a, a pretty popular book out there for business owners. Um, Profit First talks about 
you should be paying yourself first, right? Versus just paying whatever's left over in the business. Well, if you don't pay yourself, if you don't pay actual profits to yourself, you're not profitable in business. You're just really broke inside your own business. There are a lot of people that have businesses that make millions of dollars. They're millionaires, yet they're still trapped in a rat race. They can't get out because they have nothing to fall back on. There's nothing besides that one mainstream of income. So as you start to build your income stream, that main economic engine, however you best create value, then build multiple streams of income. And yes, that can be done through business and whatnot. But usually we talk to people about more like alternative investments like real estate, like various kinds of real estate that can pay you passively. Again, not being like, not being the typical person you might see in social media where you see some of these guys on TikTok or Instagram, they're out there trying to, you know, do wholesaling or flipping of properties. That's not passive. That's like a legitimate full-time business that these guys are doing, even though they're influencers trying to convince you otherwise, it's BS. I know these guys' personal lives, they're not, they're not part-time or they're very full-time in what they do. The best thing to do is then become a passive investor where you can invest with the investors, right? And that doesn't happen through a financial advisor. They can't offer this. Legally, they won't offer it. It's, it's finding those private deals, finding those good operators where, they, where it's a win-win, where your money helps be able to pot and buy that property or buy that project that they're working on. It could be apartments. It could be self-storage, although those are not doing well lately. Um, it could be, you know, single family. It could be multifamily. It could be even, like I said, like in the mineral rights and oil and gas space. It could be even like franchises, like car washes and things like that. There are so many things in this alternative world that I was never privy to as a financial advisor because they wouldn't let me see it. They were scared to let financial advisors talk about it or even know about it because it's outside of what they sell. You, as a financial advisor, work for those financial companies, not for helping make clients more money. That's a key thing. And so when I started realizing that this whole other world out there, you know, even like the raw land I mentioned, I mean, I've invested almost 400,000 in the last couple of years in raw land, and it's kicking off $9,600 a month right now. And it's growing each and every month. Like that's money that's coming in. That's real income. And so I teach people to do the same thing. Get them to the point where Again, they have enough passive income from these investments. Take the cash you have from your active income, use some of that cash to then invest in these alternative assets, this main street investing, as we call it, right? With real estate and things like that, that has a real asset backing it up. And then that kicks off returns, that kicks off income, that then gets you to the point where now you have multiple streams of income to provide for you. So we have a lot of listeners that certainly do invest in mutual funds and uh, stock market. So, you know, they might be thinking, listening, well, this sounds good, but it also sounds a little bit get rich quick. <laughs> you know, how would you suggest, say someone is like, look, I like what you're saying, but I also want to stick with some of my investments that feel like safe investments to me. How would you maybe balance, you know, dipping your toe in, into some alternative investing? Well, the first thing I would say is it's not get rich quick at all. Like not at all. I mean, if you notice like, even if you have a million dollars to then generate $100,000 a year, you still have to get that million dollars, right? Like that takes time for a lot of people to build. For most people, if they're starting from scratch, they'll probably spend at least 10 to 20 years to get to this point. Most people. I'm not saying you couldn't do it sooner. Um, I kind of beat the odds a little bit, but I was getting creative, right? But for the most part with what I teach and trying to do more conservative type of investing and in these passive investments... Uh, you're, you're looking at, you know, for, if you're starting from scratch, like I said, 10, 15, maybe 20 years at most. However, that's still a heck of a lot better than never. Because here's the truth. Fidelity, for example, Fidelity has their, their uh, you know, they come out with all their statistics, right? Only out of 45 million of their clients, only 750,000. And actually that number just grew to over 800,000 thanks to the stock market a little bit recently. About 800,000 people have at least a million bucks. So think about it, that's one and a half percent, right? That's less than 2% of people have at least a million bucks. And even of those people, 35% of those surveyed that had over a million dollars said that they, that was quote, it was going to take a miracle for them to be able to retire because they realized they couldn't live on 3%, a 30,000 a year off a million bucks. So most of them have to have multiple millions of dollars, which most people will never achieve because the stock market never pays that much. It's high risk, mediocre returns. Here's the problem, and, and you just said it, and this is, this is very common, so it's not, it's not like a problem with you. It's, it's just common that's taught because of financial advisors and institutions. They tell you, I want to do what's comfortable, right? They'll, many times people even tell me, they're like, well, I'm a, I'm a quote-unquote conservative investor. I invest in mutual funds. 
I said, well, then you're not conservative at all. Conservative to me means safe. Those are not safe at all. You can lose money easily. Now, in the last 15 years, we only had one down year in the stock market. Normally, it's for every two up years, there's one down year. You don't think that's going to come back into balance again to where we'll have a lot more down years in the future? That's going to set you back. That's going to put you back. You're not, a, you're not a conservative investor. If you put your money in mutual funds, you're a comfortable saver is what you are. Not an investor, you're a saver. You're a gambler. You are literally gambling, hoping that mutual funds will save the day. But the proof is still there. Again, it hasn't worked. Less than 2% have at least a million dollars, and that's not enough, even in today's dollars for most people. Think about it. If you went, if you went looking at reviews on Google, and all you could find was two five-star reviews for a restaurant, and there's 98 negative ones, would you go to that restaurant to eat? But why do people keep doing it over and over with mutual funds? Why? Because they've been sold that that's the way to do it. It's like the Mandalorian. This is the way, right? They think that's the only way to do it. But the problem is it's a proven path of failure, which is exactly why I couldn't teach anymore. If I want to keep my integrity intact as a, doing it as a financial advisor, I had to ignore the facts. And I couldn't do that anymore. That's why I left. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing all that, Chris. Where, where do you go from here? Do you have a target net worth or a passive income goal that you're trying to hit? Uh, I mean, I'm looking to just up it some more. I mean, uh, I think my most recent number, I was looking to get to 50,000 passive income. So currently I'm about 40,000. So I'm trying to get up to the 50,000 mark just, just for fun. I don't need to, but it'd be awesome, right? <laughs> Got to have some goals, right? Absolutely. Well, great. Let's, let's wrap up with some rapid fire questions. What's the most expensive meal out that you paid for? Uh, most expensive meal uh, actually was... Last year, I went to uh, dinner with a bunch of, bunch of cool guys, guys in business, even like Bedros Koulian. You know, if you guys ever heard of him, he had like, created a lot of gyms and stuff. Uh, but there was about 30 or 40 of us that went to a Mexican restaurant. That wasn't expensive. That was like maybe a $20 meal, but we did a $1,000 tip each of us. So we tipped everybody 1000 bucks with that meal. So that was the most expensive meal I paid for. Wow. What about the most expensive uh, pair of pants or shoes that you purchased? Oh, geez. Uh, most expensive shoes are actually my marathon running shoes. Um, in fact, I'm about to buy another pair that's about 240 bucks. Is it the Nikes? No, I'm actually I'm going for uh, their. It's actually a Saucony instead, so I'm going for a different brand, okay. similar to okay. Nike Zoom. So yeah, they, they yeah they've been brought up multiple times, so I, I had to ask. Uh, <laughs> what about the most expensive car? Was it the Mercedes? Uh, it uh, I think still to this day it is. Yeah, I just recently bought a new Pathfinder for. 55,000, but that Mercedes was 60,000. Okay. Uh, what about the most expensive vacation or experience that you paid for? Uh, that would have been Hawaii for a snowbird trip last year. Um, we ended up spending almost $40,000 for a, spending a month in Hawaii. Okay. It's not bad for a month in Hawaii. No, no, but it's, it's definitely a lot more expensive than going to Austin, Texas. <laughs> no, I know. We, we, we did a little bit of Hawaii this last summer and it, uh, you, you, you double everything basically there to, to get it to the <laughs> island. So <laughs> no kidding. Uh, what's a bucket list experience that you're still looking forward to that you haven't had yet? I'm, I'm actually, my big bucket list thing is I want to actually walk the, the Camino, Camino de Santiago that goes from like Southern France to Portugal. It's about a 500 mile hike. You ever watched the way it's a, a, a movie called the way that has a Martin Sheen in it. It got me hooked. I was like, I want to do that too. And I actually have, friends that have done it. So, uh, so that's the big thing that I want to okay. still have on my bucket list here. What was your first job? My, my first job, um, I, was, I had some business ideas that failed. Um, <laughs> I, th I think my very first job was actually working for my mom. Um, she was an artist. She had an art gallery. So when I was nine years old, I started working for her at $3 and 15 cents an hour, cleaning out like paint thinner cans, vacuuming, sweeping, whatever she needed to have done. That's what I did. Wow. Okay. Uh, what's the dumbest thing that you've ever wasted money on? <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, I would probably say, uh, probably that McMansion I bought. I mean, that was probably the dumbest thing, you know, that I could have avoided, but I still paid for and it cost me dearly. Okay. What's something that you spent way too much money on, but you don't regret it? Hmm. My wife. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is that the ex-wife or the current wife? Yes. <laughs> it's, been, it's definitely both. Uh, I, my ex-wife does not mind the child support that comes now, but uh, my current wife, um, she uh, she got us to make sure we bought a new home with a that actually has like 1.2 acres, 
We have like 12 chickens. She made it like an 80 foot by 17 foot garden and you know, all this stuff because 2020 freaked everybody out. So of course we had to go invest a lot of money into preparedness. So, uh, I love her and, uh, and she's definitely been my number one investment. There's no doubt. <laughs> okay. Uh, what's the most fun that you've had with money? You know, I think the most fun I've had usually is when it's not about me. Um, it's usually about experiences. Um, just you know, the one that comes to mind is actually is just this last December. I, I, t- I flew out my whole company and their families, like their spouses, their kids, flew us all out to Florida. And uh, we just had like our own little annual retreat and hung out at Clear- Clearwater Beach and uh, just had a fun time. Like it was one of those times that I was literally crying when everybody was going home because I didn't want it to end. That's awesome. Uh, what's a key lesson that you learned from childhood? I think the key lesson I really learned was uh, kind of what my parents taught me. My mom taught me to, to follow your passions, follow your heart. Well, my dad taught me to, to pretty much say your word is your bond, right? Like you do what you say you're going to do, like you have integrity. And that's, I'm telling you, that's the thing that's directed my life and helped me to be where I am today. Awesome. What's a closely held belief that you once had that you recently changed your mind on? Actually, I would say a closely held belief that I changed my mind on recently uh, was really uh, that, that uh, I'm not enough, that uh, I, there was always had to have more to prove, right? And that it was about, you know, me trying to fill a hole and a gap. And I would say more recently, I started to realize that I am enough just the way I am, like no more, no less. And, uh, and that's been liberating for me. Awesome. Does giving or, or charitable donations play a, a factor into your life at all? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, we, we, of course, you know, tie their money to our church, but like, uh, there's other things that we'll, we'll donate money to. Like I mentioned the thousand dollar, you know, dinner type thing that we did, you know, with the tips. Uh, I mean, totally made everybody ball, which was awesome. It felt good. But, uh, I mean, even just, you know, just the little things you can do with money, right? Like it could be just helping somebody out that, you know, that you can, you can help out, you know, that's not expecting it. Um, I mean, there's been other projects I put money behind that I thought were like really worthwhile, you know, like the chosen is one of my, I love that show and I've, uh, donated to that as well. And, and, uh, you know, become a pretty big donor there, but I mean, there's just so many ways you can serve, um, and so many people's lives you can really change and help, you know, never, never too, uh, never too far to create like a welfare system, right. Where they're dependent upon it, but at least to help just give them an, an extra boost. Yeah. That's awesome. Any last words of advice for somebody who's just getting started on their journey? Yeah, I would just say this is, oh, there's always hope, right? And no matter where you think you came from, hey, I grew up five years of my childhood in a trailer park. You know, I had the double wide, so we were the rich ones. But, you know, like, it doesn't matter where you're coming from. The thing is, if you focus on what I said earlier about how do you go about creating value for people? How do you create a win-win? How do you help serve people, solve problems, or add value in a way that money is just a byproduct? Trust me, the money, it won't be, it's not just about the money. The money will be an awesome byproduct, but you'll also realize it's a key to happiness as well. Is that how you show up to serve people, how you show up to really make a difference that this world's a better place because you're in it. You make that your focus, money will no longer be an issue and your life will be more fulfilled as well. Awesome. That's Chris with a net worth of $3.3 million. Thanks for on the show today. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Millionaires Unveiled podcast with Jace Mattinson. For more stories, investment opportunities, and information, check out our website, millionairesunveiled.com. See you next time when you'll hear from another everyday millionaire.